All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, Moose Myths and Facts. Uh, we're going to get started now. We're here with our main moose biologist, Lee Cantar, and we're going to be talking about some of the different things that we know about moose and some of the things that we think we know about moose. So I'm going to turn it over to you now, Lee. All righty. Dun, dun, dun. Here we go, some moose myths and reality. Well, thank you everybody out there in uh, Quietville for tuning in tonight and uh, for this little discussion and talk about moose myths and reality. Of course, the first reality about moose that many of you do not know is that um, when a Moose is born, it's actually a white-tailed deer. And as it gets bigger and bigger, when it reaches the age of six, it actually turns from a deer into a moose. Okay, no, that was April Fools. You all knew that. So let's start with the real myth and reality. All right, so one myth is, uh, and this is particularly personal, professional, is that getting a population estimate of moose is easy, right? That's easy to do. You just go out there and uh, you just count them as you see them. Well, it's actually a, a pretty difficult thing. And um, the biggest thing that we've been doing for the last 10 years to look at how many moose are out there uh, in the great state of Maine is we fly aerial surveys uh, with our friends at the Maine Forest Service using a helicopter and we fly at uh, essentially 200 feet above ground, which is, oh, just above the tops of the tallest pine trees. And so if you're a moose on the ground and you hear a helicopter coming, you're gonna be uh, running out of the way in the middle of winter when we conduct these, and we can get a pretty good count of moose as they're moving across uh, our flight lines. And so that's been our really, in the last 10 years, um, that's really been the most important uh, aspect of our work. It's not easy because we fly in the winter time when snow is on the ground from December to mid-February covering um, you know hundreds of square miles and flying all day it gets uh, it can be pretty rough um, doing that and trying to stay focused um, you know during the course of seven hours in a, in a in a small little helicopter although there are some moments where it's it's enjoyable and fun. Uh, we also collected a lot of data on hunter harvest that can tell us a lot about a population. This picture here on the right is actually showing a picture down here of a section tooth. And any of you who have been on a moose hunt and are interested in the age of your moose, um, this time of year, people are always asking me, you know, how old is my moose? And we put that on our website. Uh, this picture in the middle shows the tool that cuts the sections. And there's actually a moose canine teeth tooth locked down here that's cut and becomes this section and we read that and we can get the ages of moose, all the bull moose and cows that are harvested, look at the age distribution and tells us a lot about the population. We also look at reproductive data, um, winter tick counts and survival data to know how many moose we, we, we uh, lose every year and how many are born every year. And we do a bunch of uh, computer modeling and such, but all these things get pretty complex to pull together to get estimates of moose. Um, so it can be a challenging, challenging process. But, uh, you know, we talk, we're going to talk about myths and realities tonight a little bit here. And, um, you know, one reality is that right now in our current uh, planning process that was driven by public's interest, uh, we're, we're managing moves for the health of the population. And that's something we're going to dig into a little bit tonight as well, because Health is really about uh, cow and calf moose. You see this beautiful little picture of a little really young calf here, probably uh, three to four week old calf. Um, how these calves uh, survive every year and how many are dropped on the ground in mid-May by the cow uh, has the most significant impact on the moose population and whether that moose population increases or decreases or stays stable. And one of the things you've heard about a lot, if you've heard my talks at all before, is that 
you know, the winter tick, which we'll briefly touch on here as well, really impacts these little calves when they're trying to get through their first winter. And actually right now in the month of March, uh, well, sorry, April now, is the worst time for the winter tick being on the moose and taking blood from these moose and, and impacting them. And right now we're losing uh, some of these calves that are trying to make it to their first birthday because of the impacts of ticks. Um, so we'll, we'll, mention, we'll mention that in our myth and reality slides. Dun, dun, dun. So another reality versus a myth is that Maine's moose population is currently stable. We've had a lot of talk over the years now with winter tick. Um, and the interesting thing when we talk about how big our moose population is, is that it has been impacted by ticks and we have lost moose and we do have less moose in Maine than we had oh, about 20 years ago at the high point. But we still have a lot of moose because, um, you know, the core range of moose, which is really when you get up towards Moosehead Lake all the way to the Quebec border to the west and up to the Quebec New Brunswick border in the north is really where the bulk of our moose are. And so we've lost moose on the fringes when we get down towards southern and coastal Maine. Um, but the core range is still holding pretty strong, but that's also where we're seeing a lot of impacts on the health of the population and what it does to calves, like I just mentioned, but also the toll it can take on cows that are pregnant right now um, and trying to make it through to May to give birth to a new calf. Um, so just because you have a lot of moose or a high density of moose doesn't mean it's necessarily a healthy population. And that's something we've been learning sort of the hard way um, through our research over the last um, seven years on moose and winter ticks. In this picture, by the way, that's a picture from the helicopter. That's actually eight bull moose that are running away in a clear cut. They're all hanging out together here. Um, and there's a nice picture on the right of our of a little bull, a calf, and a cow uh, hanging out together in another area. Myth: Because Maine has few large predators, moose will always experience positive population growth. In other words. Um, if nothing's eating them, no tooth and fang out there eating up moose, um, adult moose, that the population is going to keep growing and growing and growing. Well, the crazy thing that we've seen here is that the little tiny winter tick is actually our predator. And that's the thing that's taking the, the proverbial bite out of the moose population. And if you look on my little pie chart here, um, and just this list of things, this is based on um, several hundred um, moose calves that we followed in our GPS collar study. And the majority of those moose, um, 264 of those moose, I think that's like 85% or something of all the moose that, that died um, were due to winter tick. And all the other causes of mortality that kills young moose in this instance, um, are very small percentages. Illegal harvest, we only had one shot. Um, we had one drowning victim. We had a couple of road kills, which is actually kind of surprising. Um, and those, those, I'm sorry, those were actually adult moose uh, from the study. Um, and then we had some taken during the legal harvest, but really this huge number here, 264, is the driver of what affects moose uh, annually as far as causes of mortality. So um, really, really interesting to put that into perspective that the winter tick is the big uh, predator, so to speak, or I should say the tiny predator with a big impact. Myth, there are less moose in Maine and less opportunity to view them. Well, so this picture here, look at this moose here. Everybody, I can't talk to you guys, but uh, do you see that moose? Isn't that interesting that uh, that's not the easiest guy to see here. He's, he's a nice little bull uh, bedded down in the woods. But, uh, you know, moose have become in some ways more difficult to see to people for many reasons. I mean, back in the 80s and 90s, um, there was much larger clear cuts. People could roll out into the big woods in the logging roads and see further distances. Um, now you drive some of the main logging roads. Um, 
whether it's the Reality Road or Rocky Brook or Pinkham Road, and there's there's not as much room to see out there, and uh, that makes it more challenging as well. Of course, uh, you know, with the change in climate and things, um, moose are difficult to see in the middle of the summertime. You know, people will see moose in the water and things like that, but if people are just going around in the woods trying to find a moose and it's 80 degrees out, uh, moose are hanging out in a thick stand of wood, um, trying to hang out in the shade. They lie down like a, like a big dog and get their whole bellies lying on the soft ground uh, to cool themselves. Uh, last year, when uh, during our moose study, um, the collars are meant to drop off the moose. And <clears throat> when they drop off the moose, they send a signal and I go pick up those collars in the woods. And I picked up a whole mess of collars last July. And I had people asking me in July, where do you see a moose? Well, where I picked up those collars was in wood so thick that if you were standing next to me, um, I wouldn't be able to see you. So how could I ever see a moose from a road or something when the moose in those woods uh, are impossible to see? Um, you know, and over the years, moose learn that perhaps they want to stay out of the roads, uh, avoid traffic, avoid being approached by people. Um, but moose watching, you know, whether it's trying to go see moose in ponds and rivers in June and July and August, that can be pretty good if you have a mode of transportation. But, you know, moose also are keyed in on early morning and, and, and uh, evening before, before dark. And uh, this, when we, when the snow finally recedes and the moose woods come, uh, come this month and into May, uh, moose head towards mineral licks on the sides of the roads. And it's good to get out there at first light and be looking for moose and uh, as well as just before dark. Um, those are always good times to try to see moose uh, in the moose woods or the moose roads next to the moose woods. Myth, all ticks are created equal. Mm. They're all equal in the sense that they're evil little buggers that, that are really kind of awful and disgusting. But um, the reality is, is that the three major ticks that we have in Maine are the deer tick, the dog tick, and the winter tick. And they're very different. Everybody knows the deer tick are the ones that we see, especially across Southern Maine, coastal Maine, central Maine. They carry disease that impacts us as human beings, like Lyme disease. And everybody needs to be hyper aware of ticks and to do everything they can to protect themselves and their family against ticks and their dogs. Um, my dogs are picking up uh, little tiny nymph deer ticks right now outside of the Bangor area. They're active along the road ditches and people got to be very careful. But deer ticks and dog ticks have a three host life cycle. They live for several years. Every life cycle, larva, nymph, adult, they spend on the back or of a different animal, a host, and they take blood from that animal. Three different animals to complete their life cycle. These awful looking ticks that you see in the photo are adult winter ticks. And there's a bunch of females in here that are engorged with blood. And there's a couple, I can see at least one male in there that's not engorged. These are the adult winter ticks that are in their third stage feeding on a moose. And the thing about the winter tick is it lives for one year. Uh, the three life cycle, the three parts of its life cycle, larva, nymph, adult, where they're taking blood, is all in the same animal. And that's why they're so bad. And not only that, but if an animal had a deer tick on it, it may have you may get five, 10, 15 deer ticks, a whole mess of dog ticks. Our poor friend, the moose, when it gets winter tick on it, will have 50 to 70,000 ticks of on them. And when you have 50,000 ticks on you and they're feeding with this much blood, each one of these adult females is about a mill of blood. A mill of blood that it's like, where's my camera here? Oh, you, hard to tell with my hand, but it, it's, it's a little bit of blood. And 50,000 of those is, is too much and, and is overwhelms a moose, moose's system and can lead to death in a moose this time of year when they're trying to make it to their first birthday. So one reality about winter tick is they have existed in Maine since, well, we can document it back to the 30s. So a lot of people ask us and say, is this an alien species 
um, is an exotic? Where did it come from? Well, we can document it in our files from the uh, 30s. That's a long time, so easily 100 years. Winter ticks uh, live from Texas to uh, southern Canada. They're all over the place. But even though they've been here all these years, we haven't seen them impacting moose to the extent they are now until probably the late 90s. And then it became really apparent, apparent. And research done in New Hampshire next door around the turn of the century, around 2002, um, where they collared moose. They were finding a bunch of dead moose from ticks. And then New Hampshire and Maine together started work on our current research in 2014 and found that winter tick was the absolute driver of moose mortalities. And this little picture on the right here shows kind of a demonstration that when you have a high population of moose versus a lower population of moose, um, it creates a scenario where as moose populations grew in the 90s into the early 2000s, the tick population grew behind it. And then it started taking out our little calves here and impacting reproduction. We're hoping that a lower moose population would mean less ticks because it's really dependent. The number of ticks out there are really tied to the number of moose that are out there. The more moose and the more moose packed in together, the higher the number of ticks. Uh, so winter ticks. I got, there we go. Can you all hear me now? I think there was a- I can hear you now. Was I, on, was I mute the whole other time? Nope, just, just for when you made the switch there. Beautiful, all right. I got this awful picture of myself that keeps getting in the way of my actual pictures in this talk. Um, so let me back up that one slide there. We already, I already mentioned that ticks occur in a real variety of places from the warm parts of Texas, uh, all the way up to the Canadian uh, provinces. The interesting thing is that other areas like in the upper Midwest, in the Western United States, in Southern Canada, where they've had a bad tick year, where a lot of, where ticks have killed a lot of moose, they've seen it happen in one year, and then it kind of goes away. In our state of Maine, um, what we saw in seven years of our research is that six out of those seven years, we saw very high mortality rates of our calves. In fact, in several years, we had uh, over 70% of our calves did not make it to their first, first birthday because of winter tick. That's been unprecedented in the Northeast as far as the winter tick is concerned and people have not seen that in other places. So it's really been uh, something unique, unfortunately, to our Northeast with Maine, New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, another reality is that winter tick survival relies on favorable conditions. This has been a, a complicated process for us to learn about because not only do ticks require a host that doesn't realize the ticks are on it, like the moose does in the fall. So ticks will get on other animals, snowshoe hare and deer, but they're very good at grooming the ticks off of them. But the moose has no idea um, the ticks are on them in the fall. And so ticks do really well when there's a lot of moose because they're on the moose and they can go through their life cycle. And as the climate changes and winter gets shorter in the fall, the summer and fall get longer, the conditions are perfect for every day it's warm out for more ticks to get on the moose as it walks through the woods and acquires more and more ticks to a point where it gets those 50, 60, 70,000 ticks that become a lethal dose for a young small moose. And so that's really tough. And there appears to be an area in Northern New Hampshire, Northern Vermont, uh, Western Central Maine, that's really the worst as far as having a little bit shorter winter and plenty of moose up there that's created the conditions where we lose a bunch of young animals. And then as you get further North into the far Northern Maine, the impact is not quite as bad. Um, and into Canada, it's not quite as bad, but it's starting to worsen. Um, because of these shorter winters. So another myth, winter tick impacts 
<coughs> all mammals equally, excuse me. Well, I mentioned how deer, things like deer and snowshoe hare get ticks on them, but they realize it. And, you know, of all the members of the deer family, deer, elk, caribou, moose, deer um, really handle it well. Elk, they, they can get plagued by winter tick, but moose are really the ones that get just blasted by these guys. And um, they're just not, a, they're not good at grooming themselves until it's too late in midwinter. That's when they really start feeling the nymphal ticks on them and start grooming. Um, and that's a point where it's too late. And not only are ticks problematic because they're taking and removing, removing blood, which causes a state of anemia, um, but in young animals as well as adults, it can cause excessive hair loss from the scratching and the irritation and the excessive grooming that the moose does um, in February and March. And if it's a really cold February and March, then those poor moose are losing the insulation, the value of their hair. And they're, they're so restless, they should be bedding down and ruminating. They should be feeding. They shouldn't be standing up, being driven crazy by scratching and grooming themselves from ticks. A miserable existence if there was one. Another reality we'll talk about is that despite ticks impacting calves, adult moose survival is still high in Maine, even in the face of winter tick. So what I'm trying to show you here is that if you have 50,000 winter ticks taking blood from a 400 pound calf, and if you look at my picture on the right, here's a, a cow with twins. This twin on the left never made it. You can see the twin has its ears down. That's not a good sign. It's not, it doesn't have its ears down because it's mad. Uh, it has its ears down because it's in very poor health. This calf did not make it very long past this picture. Anyways, um, if you have 50,000 winter ticks taking blood from a 400 pound calf on the left, and those same amount of ticks taking blood from an 800 pound calf, I mean, sorry, 800 pound cow, pardon me, um, who's twice the size of, and weight and has fat on her, there's a huge difference in blood loss. And you'll see this picture on my left is basically saying that a calf has to replace way more blood than either an adult cow or an adult bull. Um, and that's, that's a huge problem, okay? So the size of the animal makes a big difference. These calves, when they go into winter time, uh, have no fat on their bodies. There's no reserves for them. And these guys are all feeding on a diet that's mostly browse and is very low in protein. You need protein to build back your blood. And this cow entered winter, to, you know, even though she had two calves, she entered winter in a pretty good state. Um, she actually looks in pretty good condition. Um, you know, and this is probably a picture taken in March. Um, so a very, very difference uh, between the two sizes of these animals. So more myths, and these myths and realities were taken from uh, questions we've gotten in the past from people who've tuned in to listen to some of our uh, talks on moose. So the department works alone to determine the population trends and status of moose, myth. Well, it's a myth because uh, all of us in the moose world lean, lean very heavily on each other to understand um, everything there is about moose. And in the past, if you didn't know something about moose or um, didn't understand something, a particular thing about moose, biology, ecology, movement or ticks, you'd, you'd ask somebody else. And uh, we're very fortunate in the state of Maine that we have a long-term collaboration with the University of New Hampshire to look at uh, winter ticks and moose mortality. We've been working with them now for over eight years. Uh, I'm working with a student, a postdoctoral student at University of Cincinnati, looking at winter tick physiology and trying to understand what makes ticks tick. Sorry for that pun. Uh, we work closely with the University of Maine right here in Orono to look at uh, blood parasites in these moose. We look at home range and habitat use, uh, a lot of different things. And I'm also working now with the University of New Brunswick in Canada, Fredericton, New Brunswick, and Laval University in Quebec to also look at 
they are looking at moose ecology movement and winter ticks and we share all of our experiences and information on how to do things uh, better so it's a real collaboration across the whole northeast in the u.s and canada another myth resolving or mitigating winter tick impacts requires implementing common parasite control techniques so we get this question all the time over and over again um, which is great because it shows us that people are very concerned about moose and that they've heard us talk a lot about moose and how can they help and so people have always said well why don't you put a tick collar on the moose um, with pesticide or have a paintball gun season and hit them hit them hit the moose with pesticide or um, put out um, salt blocks with insecticide or ivermectin etc cetera, etc cetera. those are great great ideas um, you know in reality um, you know tick collars and giving pills to moose I mean you know people equate that to our dog and I have two dogs um, I give them flea and tick medicine once a month um, both of my dogs get different pills based on their weight um, and they get a Lyme booster as well um, so they get preventative. They have a veterinarian. They get to see it once a year. Um, moose are wild animals, and we have no ability to um, inoculate, um, put tick collars on a 400-pound, 800-pound animal and change those collars out and do that work. Because really, um, to protect one moose or 10 moose or 100 moose is a noble cause, but it's not going to impact winter ticks. It's not going to change the trajectory of what's going on when you have 50, 60,000 moose across what's basically 10 million acres of forest. We can't spray the woods. We don't own the woods. Uh, it's privately owned. Uh, spraying that would kill ticks, would kill every insect out there, ruin water quality. Um, baiting and feeding moose doesn't draw in many moose. It, it creates problems with, with what you're baiting them with and the in the application of the insecticide it um we've looked at a lot of these things and looked very closely at them along with our friends over in canada as well and none of them have been feasible or practical or cost effective or anything but we continue to entertain those things and, and think very hard on it to find solutions controlled burns has been another um technique that's been mentioned and they it probably works on a small scale uh successful in grassland areas but in 10 million acres, uh, 16,000 square miles of commercial forest lands where private landowners are trying to grow trees for commercial value, um, that's just not something that's ever gonna be uh, feasible or make sense in a working forest to have a, a controlled fire. People ask about, why don't you bring opossums in? We already have opossums in the Southern part of the state, or maybe you could stock the woods with guinea hens. Um, problem with that is, you know, the state of Maine is not going to spend all kinds of money to bring in something like a guinea hen, which is probably from Africa, that would not make it through um, <clears throat> a Maine winter where, where our moose are. So, so our moose uh, live in the toughest part of the state with the deepest snow depths in areas that are very difficult to traverse for, for most people. And it's a place where opossums, unless we stop getting snow up there, um, we're not going to have opossums make it up there. And none of these animals, frankly, are going to do enough to put a dent in the population. Turkeys um, are very, very efficient at eating insects and eating ticks. They didn't bring, they did not bring ticks into the state, um, but they're very good at eating them. And we, we got turkeys up in the north country a bit. Um, we have Canada jays um that will fly down and eat ticks off of moose but when you look at this picture when you look at this picture here there's a picture of my hands on a dead calf moose and then the blown up picture of how many ticks there are just on that one space and i guarantee you you could have a hundred birds feeding on these on this one moose and you're probably not going to put a dent on the number of ticks when you have tens of thousands on a single moose it's just, it's a crazy amount of ticks to get rid of. 
Our reality is that we spent uh, seven years conducting a survival study where we've seen and demonstrated the impacts by winter tick on these animals. Um, these calves here, this one that we're working on on the right that, that died, these moose in January weigh 400 pounds, these moose calves, and they've lost 20 to 30%. Uh, on average, about 26% of their body weight by the time this month of April rolls around, which leads to their death. Um, that's a profound impact by, uh, by winter tick that we've documented uh, using the scientific method. One other reality too, is that when we have a moose hunt that uh, has been shown by the public that 90% of Mainers uh, respect and, and uh, are in support of a moose hunt, um, you know, moose hunting is a great thing. It's a cultural thing. Um, it's our outdoor heritage, but it, you know, it can also provide a lot of important information on moose for us, as well as become an important management tool for combating ticks. Um, you know, during the fall hunt, we look at winter ticks. There's some really ugly pictures here of a engorged female. Uh, that I showed you before and a bunch of ticks on the right here. So we do tick counts in the fall on moose that have been harvested that give us a good estimate of how bad that winter is going to be or how um, moderate it's going to be with our winter tick loads. And we can anticipate, and we're working with New Hampshire on this to figure this out statistically, um, we're going to be able to anticipate what our overwinter mortality of these calves is going to look like come spring based on these fall tick counts are so pretty important. We also, during the cow harvest, are able to get these little bodies, which is an ovary in this bottom picture, um, which has these round structures in there called corpora lutea, which tell us about how um, our moose cow reproduction is and whether it goes up or down in a given year. So pretty, pretty informative stuff that we're able to glean uh, from these moose. So we're gonna talk a little bit about one of the proposals we've put forth to try to deal with winter tick that is a feasible solution. And that is to create an adaptive or experimental unit up in the northwestern portion of the state. This is zone four. Um, this is just above Moosehead Lake to the west. It's the upper reaches of the St. John River. Um, and based on science, we have chosen to implement a adaptive management unit in half of the study area, which, comp which uh, comprises 6% of the moose range, which includes management districts one through 11 plus 19. So this whole area of Maine is about 16,000 square miles. And we're just going to increase cow permits in one half of this unit, 6% of the core range. Um, to look at whether we can um, affect the impact of winter ticks by reducing the moose population in that area and trying to break the winter tick cycle. Uh, this is an area where we've had very low moose uh, productivity because of the impact of winter tick. It's a good representation of moose habitat in the north and western part of the state. And it's right, it sits right in between our district two where we've had a five year study in District 8, where we did seven years of GPS collared cows. And two years ago, we started collaring uh, calves in District 4. In our first year, we saw 38% 38, 38 of those calves uh, died before their first birthday due to winter tick impacts. And right now, I'm following another uh, 69 calves right now to see what their fate may or may not be due to winter tick. So the reality of this adaptive unit, and here is a, a close up of the unit and how it's broken into two sections, is that uh, again, it's 6% of the core range. We're gonna increase permits just in this left side, this Western side, um, and see over the next five years, if we can reduce the moose population, monitor the moose population, uh, bring it down to a lower level that's much more healthy so that we can then increase the productivity of cows and try to rid ourselves of the winter tick. Um, you know, as we said before, we've continued to work with Quebec, New Brunswick, 
New Hampshire and Vermont on this type of thing. Um, Vermont's, you know, working at this same issue in New Hampshire as well, all trying to wrestle with this. And they're all very keen and interested to see uh, what happens in our state in the next five years in this, in this small area uh, to see if we can have some success. And uh, we're going to continue to call our calves, 60 to 70 calves in this study area for the next few years. Um, we'll collect more information on tooth ages. We'll do the winter tick counts. We'll weigh um, harvested moose. We'll look at the ovaries. Uh, every year this past uh, January and February, we'll fly aerial surveys to look at moose abundance to count moose and to quantify the ratios of bull to cows to calves. Uh, all of this information will be really focused uh, on the core range, but, but we'll really prioritize uh, doing that in District 4 so we can understand how things are going in our adaptive unit as we implement uh, this management tool. So in the end, the reality is, is that, um, you know, there's, there's a couple of outcomes. We may increase the harvest and bring down the moose population in that one, one small area and it has no effect on ticks. Um, the other hand, we may increase the harvest there, reduce tick numbers and improve reproduction uh, and reduce the number of calf mortalities. Whichever way it goes, um, it's a scientific approach that when, we're, when all is said and done down the road here, we'll be able to look back and discover through scientific method um, the practicality, the functionality, and whether this is going to be an effective management tool or not to sustain a, a healthy moose population. So we're looking forward to that and seeing uh, what we can do to really try to, try to help our moose, even though that's a counterintuitive thing to be thinking about. Um, the bottom line is that our moose population in, this, in that part of Maine is, is actually pretty high relative to normal moose populations across the North American range. And uh, given climate change, shorter winters, uh, and the increase in winter ticks over the last 10 to 15 years, um, this is the most reasonable, rational, um, feasible thing that we can implement to try to deal with it and demonstrate whether it works or not. So we're going to leave you with a few fun facts about moose since we talked about the dreary nature of the winter tick, but we know that our good friend, the moose is the largest member of the deer family. And I mentioned that before you can, you can quiz people at the, uh, at the Easter dinner table this Sunday and ask them what's the biggest member of the deer family or what are the four members of the deer family? And you can say, well, there's deer, muleys, whitetail, black tail deer. And then there's uh, caribou that's a member of the deer family. And then elk, Rocky Mountain elk, Roosevelt elk, and then the best member of the deer family of all, which is our friend, the moose. Four members of the deer family. Fun fact about a bull, that dangly flap below the chin is called a bell or a dewlap. Um, cows have them. They have little stringy dewlaps, but you'll notice this beautiful bull on the left and right has a big bell-shaped dewlap that swings down. Um, during the rut in the fall, when they make pits and they urinate in these pits, when they're getting ready for the breeding season, um, these bull moose will stomp in these pits. They get really muddy and all of the stuff in that pit, all the urine and everything that's in there gets thrown up on them and covers their chest and their dewlap. So their dewlap and they'll lay down in the pit and that gets to be really attractive for the opposite sex during the breeding season. So it serves a purpose uh, to advertise that uh, they're the baddest bull in town. Moose also have a four chambered stomach, just like other cervids. Uh, that's a fun thing to, uh, to actually look at. If you ever get the chance to look at the inside of a moose stomach, I know you guys are all very excited about that opportunity. Um, but that's a talk for another day. Uh, bull moose, of course, shed their antlers every year. Um, and we have lots of shed hunters in the state of Maine who like to, this time of year, go into the woods and try to find those sheds. I'd like to do that. Um, pretty exciting thing to do. And then starting in about April, um, 
those moose and this moose in this picture is going to start regrowing uh, those antlers again. And they got to be good to go by the end of August when the velvet and the soft antlers, they're soft during the summertime while they're growing out, highly vascularized, lots of blood flowing through them. Uh, by the time August comes around, they're, they're starting to get itchy and, and signaling that the, the antlers are turning to bone. They start scraping off the velvet to reveal these beautiful bony structures called, <clears throat> called antlers. And a big bull can grow, its antler can grow as much as, a, as much as three quarters of an inch in a day. So think about this. The moose you see on July 4th, during your July 4th celebration, the big bull you see, if you check him out two weeks later, he's gonna be looking a lot different because those antlers grow so fast. Moose can travel up to 35 miles per hour and are powerful swimmers. Now this bull moose, photographed by yours truly, uh, was steaming across this lake in, uh, it was late August, late July, I'm sorry, early August. And what was amazing is uh, when he started to really motor, uh, how his hump, the hump, which is the shoulder muscles that have to be massive to hold the massive head and antler of a bull moose, just comes right out of the water. That moose is swimming so fast with its four legs. Very impressive. Moose can dive over 10 feet, dive down into the water. They have self-sealing nostrils um, and they can feed on the bottom of ponds and uh, really, really efficient in the water and efficient at feeding underwater. But moose are solitary animals and uh, really most North American moose populations in a natural setting they exist at about one moose per square mile. Um, our northern areas of the state have over five moose per square mile. These are solitary animals because they require a tremendous amount of food, 30 pounds of, of vegetation in the summertime every day um, to survive. So they require a lot of food. So you can't have a ton of moose hanging out together um, because there's just not enough food out there. And we're lucky our commercial forest lands in the state of Maine, um, you know, give us a ton of food and, and we have uh, been able to grow a lot of moose. But now with winter tick on the landscape and a climate change, um, it's too many moose for their own good. So just to recap, um, while the moose population in Maine is down from its high point 20 years ago, uh, it's still solid in the core range and uh, in, in moderate to high in, in some of those areas. Um, but winter tick is impacting cows in their pregnancy. This picture is actually a, a cow that's really on the thinner side of life and just gave birth to this calf that's probably a month old. Um, but not only that, but you know, so we have some calves that are born to these cows and never make it past their first three weeks because the cow is in poor shape. And then this poor little guy has to make it through their first year. Um, and this time of year in April is really, really the pinch point for those guys trying to get to their first birthday. We had a seven year research study. We collared over uh, 600 animals. Uh, today we've collared over 675 moose, put GPS PS collars on them. Um, we had high calf mortality in our Western study area. It was less in our Northern study area. We documented low productivity, but we, we still have high um, high survival of our adults, which, which at least that's, that's a positive thing. Um, and again, moving forward, we're gonna implement this adaptive unit mostly and see if that can help us with the tick situation. Um, so anyways, we, we appreciate everybody tuning in tonight. And Laura, if you're, if you're out there and in the land here, I don't know if we're gonna take a few questions or yeah, well, definitely. We have some questions that just came in, so we'll uh, we'll stop the screen share. All right. So while you were talking, a few questions were coming in, so we'll read through some as many as we can get to. Um, so there's definitely some interest in understanding a little bit more about um, the tick connection um, with the moose. And so um, one question was, what theories do our biologists have for why Maine has such a high mortality rate compared to other places or regions that also have winter tick? 
That's an awesome question. That's a very smart question. Um, you know, one of the there, there's some very different things going on in the state of Maine. One of them is that we have some of the highest densities of moose um, when you look across the North American range. So when I say that, we have moose, let's just talk about the United States. We have moose in the Northeast, uh, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, small population in New York, all the way down to Massachusetts and Connecticut. Then we have moose in the upper Northwest. We're talking, uh, I'm sorry, upper, upper Midwest. We're talking um, Michigan and Minnesota and Minnesota's had a lot of problems. And then you have moose in the Montane region going out to Utah and Wyoming, and then moose out in Washington state. And all those things are very different because um, there's a difference in the moose habitat itself. And, um, and there's a difference in, in, in the type of wildlife that's out there. So for instance, Minnesota is a place that has wolves, okay? And I'm not making any big statements about wolves, but of, of the moose that they lose, um, a lot of them get eaten by wolves. And if you're gonna go see if winter tick is impacting a moose, uh, like we are in, in April, um, there's nothing left of that, of that moose to check out and see. Um, in the Northeast here, uh, we don't have a top-down predator. Uh, we grow a lot of moose. We have high moose densities in those, in those core ranges. And that connection is lots of moose, lots of ticks, shorter winters, okay? So as you go further into Northern Maine and you get up into Quebec, and especially as you get above uh, Quebec City, you're not gonna have winter tick up there and you're gonna, because you have longer winters, okay? And you have a lot lower moose densities. So the three factors that you will not see in any other state is the number, the density of moose, the shorter winter, and then the number of ticks that's produced. So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, I definitely think that that does answer the question for people. Um, another question, um, and you, you went over this a little bit again, but I might help to hear it again, is um, what are the trends in reproduction in relation to winter tick? Is it increase or in decreasing the breeding for moose? Well, that's complicated when you say the last part about breeding, because the thing is, is that the majority of cow moose are breeding. They're getting bred in the fall right, during the rut. The thing is, is what happens after that, okay? So what that means is the cow gets pregnant at the end of September, early October, and then she, and at the same time, she's acquiring ticks. She's getting ticks on her, right? So then the ticks start feeding on her. December, January comes along. She's growing a, a calf fetus inside her. The ticks are feeding on her, and in a bad case, she's starting to lose her condition because now she's got a fetus inside her that depends on her fat reserves and her body that's feeding the fetus, but she's being fed on by a winter tick. Now March and April comes around right now when the majority of adult winter ticks are feeding on the moose and now she's rapidly losing body condition. She's still gonna give birth May 15th to a calf. But what we've seen is there'll be stillbirths, there will be calves that are born and on day one, they don't survive. And perhaps she has trouble with lactation demands because her body fat reserves to get her through the winter have been, have been evaporated. And we know this because in the 1980s, after the spruce budworm and our moose came back and started recolonizing and going down all the way to Connecticut, um, we had a higher twinning rate of moose every year. 40% of our cows would have twins. Now it's way less than 20%. Um, cows would breed successfully and carry the fetus to a calf uh, more often than not and start at a younger age, meaning more like two years old. Now it's more like three. And we had more yearlings back then that would actually breed successfully. Whereas now there's some years when no yearlings uh, are going to successfully calf. Um, and those things compound each other so that you have much less productivity, which means much fewer calves dropped on the ground in May. And if you're dropped on the if you dropped on the ground in May and you weigh 25 pounds as a calf versus 35, you're probably not going to make it through your first three weeks of life. 
That's good. In, it's good information. It's it's a it's a lot it's a lot to learn. But no worries, people. This will be this will be recorded. You can watch it again later. <laughs> uh, so another question does relate to ticks, and so the question is: so with a warming climate, um, can we expect there to be more winter ticks as well as other variety of ticks here in Maine? Well, that's another great question because the complication of climate is that. I mean, on one hand, I would say yes. I mean, obviously, um, I was not born and raised in Maine. Don't, don't, don't hate me. Um, but you know, we know many of our neighbors, right? That, and even where I live, I've been here for over 15 years. Where 15 years ago, um, I was never worried about deer ticks where I live, and now it's a fact of life. Um, and so that's one tick species. Now, the winter tick species is very dependent on in the fall, it hatches out as an egg and then it climbs up the nearest bush and it waits in those bushes by the thousands for a moose to come by. Well, if you get an early storm that comes in, let's just say in October, you get a snowstorm that stays for three days and kills those ticks, that nukes all the ticks, right? That are out there in the North Woods in, in the winter tick. But if we don't get that, Every single day a moose is walking through the woods doing its thing and it's picking up a thousand ticks here, a thousand ticks there. And then tomorrow it wakes up and it goes through the same thing until the weather gets so severe that it shuts down the curtain and no more ticks are able to get on the moose. And that's a problem. And the climate folks at the university have said that the data shows that summer is now extended two weeks and that two weeks more means there's two more weeks of ticks getting on a moose. So instead of the moose having 10,000 ticks on it, now, two weeks later, I'm talking about in, in October, uh, two weeks later, instead of 10,000, now it's got 30,000 ticks on it. And that may be a lethal, a lethal dose for that moose, you see? So, so that's a problem. But where in Maine are we gonna experience the most shortening of winter? And is that precipitation going to come as rain or snow? That's going to be a big, big determination too over the years. So on that note, um, some people were curious about um, how the department is, uh, is studying moose. So like how large a role does inland fisheries and wildlife play in the study of moose? And are there ways that people can help submit photos or observations or anything like that of the moose in Maine? Well, that's a good question. I mean, you know, I pointed out the fact that I work right now with four different universities, um, let alone doing our own research here that uh, we've been doing for quite a long time. So, I mean, research, you can call research different things. Our core research is when we put uh, GPS collars on moose and monitor those moose over time, you go in and recover a dead moose to do a necropsy and figure out what's going on physically, physiologically, um, when we have that moose on the ground. Um, but we also do research and management where we're doing every year aerial surveys where we're um, conducting statistical counts on moose, where we're evaluating uh, reproduction and productivity and all that. So we have a very, very, in the last 10 years, an extremely active uh, management program on top of sharing information and learning from our colleagues and neighbors, especially here in the Northeast, as well as collaborations with the universities and all the work we do. So um, there was another part of that question though. People were wondering if there's a way or a oh, they can help. to submit any kind of help or photos. Yeah. So, you know, I, I once in a while I get, I, I'm always interested in interesting things that people see with moose. One of the future things that we're just starting to look at that may have a role or may not down the road um, that many people do now is, is obviously camera trapping, remote cameras. And the scientific community has been working very hard on putting together uh, significant networks of remote cameras to actually statistically look at occurrences of all kinds of species, as well as get estimates of numbers of animals. And moose may be uh, one of those. I'm actually working, we're gonna be working with a, dare I say, fifth university um, on this exact question. And I could, I could envision a role down, 
for you know more citizen sciences to to send in their information. Um, so we're, we're always curious and we're always willing and able to answer questions that people pose with uh, things that they see in the woods on moose. For me, for moose, it's all about moose. No, oh, that's great. And anytime somebody feels like you have something to share, you can always contact um, the department. And it's, it's always nice to know that people are, are keeping an eye on the wildlife as well. So uh, we do have a few more questions. We, are, we do want to be mindful of the time. So we'll just ask a few more here. Um, there was a question about um, if you see a moose when you're hiking, like you accidentally get too close to it, what's the best thing that you should do? And like, should you walk? Should you run away? What should you do if you encounter a moose? Um, well, you can definitely, and I've been there, where you can, by accident, get too close to a moose. Literally, I mean, really close. Um, and the best thing to do is to literally stop <clears throat> and start slowly backing away. Um, if a, you know, a moose is very good at acting like it doesn't care until the second it really does care. And it can turn uh, and be very upset very quickly. Um, and so moose, moose need to be given their bubble uh, and a big bubble because what you key in on is on their backs, just like dogs, um, they will raise their hackles. They will take their eyes, white of their eyes like this and start making googly eyes at you. Um, and then they'll take their ears and start doing some crazy things, which that's then you're way too close if you're seeing any of that. And you know, you know, the moose, a moose can charge somebody. Now that being said, um, for seven years, seven summers, I had young folks working for me in the summer who would sneak in on radio collared cows to see if they had calves with them. And everybody hears, what's the most dangerous animal in the woods? Well, it's a cow and a calf. I would maintain that, that a grouse that explodes out of the woods is the most dangerous animal because it'll give you a heart attack. But the cow with the calf, what we saw is that it's a 50-50 thing. 50% of those cows will run away with their calf like any smart deer would, but the other 50 will look you and say, you're going down. Um, so the advice is to, you know, to slowly back away, look for trees to get behind. Um, and if a moose is starting to be aggressive, you need to be hooting and hollering because, you know, the vision, the vision of a moose is certainly not good straight on because it's got a big bucket nose, but it sees you from the side, you need to let it know that you're a human being and you're backing off and I don't mean anything. I wouldn't run away because if you run and trip, then you're in a compromising position and moose like to stomp with their front legs and they like to stomp, they like to stomp down with their rear legs. There you go. Oh, that's a great information, especially as people are making their way more out into the woods with the warm weather. It's always good to know what to do around different wildlife. Um, we'll just do two more questions here. Um, and you did mention just now something about collared moose and somebody was wondering, um, is there some place they can find information about collared moose? They, uh, this person in particular had seen one in their yard and they were wondering how to find out more information. Well, there's, there's two ways. One is we have on our department website, we have some information on our moose work and a really nice uh, page on moose and everything about moose. That's always one way. There's always the ability to send an email that gets to me. And so if you had a moose um, with a collar on it and you saw most of these moose have ear tags. Um, so if you had a ear tag number or a location, your town where you live, where you saw the moose and that gets to me, I'm very happy to respond. I always respond to people and give them as much information about that particular moose uh, that they want. So that's, that's, that's a fun and very interesting thing. Lots of history there. Yeah, that's a great way for people to learn more about an individual moose. That's, that's really great. All right. So we'll do one last question here. It is just past seven 30. Um, and so the question was, do moose really like to lick the road salt and why? Yes, they do. Um, and, um, Moose, moose, when they come, especially when they come out of the wintertime 
have a <clears throat> uh, incredible um, appetite for salt. Okay, and that can be in many forms. And moose will will um, travel miles to go to a salt lick. In fact, we have collared moose that in the course of essentially a day, 24 hours, would go 15 miles, straight line 15 miles to find a salt lick, take their fill of the salt, the sodium, and then go back to where they were living before. They also get sodium from feeding on aquatic plants that have a higher amount of sodium in their, in the vegetation. And so when they spend a lot of time in uh, bodies of water, because they can get a lot of food quickly and they can get sodium, but they just absolutely love it. Now, interestingly, I was giving a talk in Jackman in December years ago, and uh, we got a slight bit of snow and ice storm. And I think the moose have learned behaviorally the sound of the salt truck, because on the way up to the um, talk in Jackman, I'm trying to remember if I saw like 18 moose. It was some crazy number. On the way back, they had salt of the roads and I had moose, I had a cow and a calf. The calf was bedded on the pavement and the moose was down on her knees licking the salt. Um, so really any time of year, moose, if they can get it, they enjoy that, eating the salt and they need a little bit of it, those micronutrients in their body for function, for daily function. But certainly when they come out of the winter time, because in the winter time, and this may be surprising, although moose can travel really nicely in deep snow, there is a point where later in the winter they get really confined, they don't move around a lot, and they're probably just going, hey, when is this over, man? And when the snow finally recedes and they bust out, um, they're going to go find some salt. Um, and that's that's just a natural mineral that, well, not, not when they're icing the roads, but... Um, of course, now they also use calcium carbonate or something on the roads too. And also they've done a lot of work to try to prevent moose from going to the mineral licks on the side of the roads because of the danger to vehicles. But that's another story. But yes, that, that is the answer. Well, this is all a lot of really great information and I'm sure we could sit here asking you questions for a whole nother hour. Um, but we will have more information for all of you um, soon about, uh, about moose and other animals. I just wanna thank you, Lee, for um, joining us tonight. It's always great to hear from you and learn about um, the moose in Maine. Great, thanks for joining us. Yeah. And I just wanna remind everybody that we do have some more presentations coming up if you enjoyed this one. Um, this coming Saturday on, April, on April 3rd at 1 p.m. We will have the next in our spring series on, on our YouTube channel. It's going to be Moosehead Lake Shore Spawning Brook Trout with our Regional Fisheries Supervisor, Tim Albrey. And that'll be April 3rd at 1 p.m. right here on our YouTube channel. And um, you can check out more and we'll put a link in the chat so you can see all the different ones coming up. It's like about one a week or so. Um, so some great information coming up. So we we'll hope you're joining us for those and everybody have a great night. Thank you.